because the next story is called The Poor Boy in the Grave. Not the title, is it? But it all starts with a young man. You can see him just there. He is but a lad, and unfortunately his parents, well, they died. And he had nobody in the whole wide world to take care of him. And so it was deemed that he would be sent to go and live with a wealthy couple. Well, that seems quite good, doesn't it? Yes. But this wealthy couple, they were mean and they were horrible. They kept all their money for themselves and they didn't want to share one single penny. So when the boy arrived, well, they didn't want to spend any money on food or drink for him or anywhere nice to sleep. And they treated him as an unpaid servant, a slave. And when he complained of being hungry, they punished him bitterly. But he was sent one day out into the yard to go and keep a check on the chickens. <laughs> and there was a big, fat mama hen. <laughs> <laughs> and she had five little chicks following on behind it. And they were wandering all around the yard. But as they did, well, the mother hen, she found a gap in the hedge. And she made her way through. And her little chicks followed her. And it was only then that the poor boy suddenly saw that the chickens had escaped and they were out in the field. And oh no, and oh dear, what was he going to do? And he called to get them back. And he hollered and he screamed. But they wouldn't listen. And it was then that from over the horizon came a hungry hawk who spied the chickens and with one high-pitched call started to dive down and down and down again, grabbed hold of the big fat mama chicken in her talons and carried her high and far away. Num, 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 lunch. <laughs> But it was just then that the rich man came back and he saw his prized chicken disappearing in the talons of the hawk and he was furious. And in such a rage did he get that that poor boy didn't leave his room for two whole days. And when he finally went back to work, it was his job to look after all the little chicks. But now they didn't have Mother Hen to follow around afterwards. They were running around all over the place, scattering here and there. And the poor boy was trying to run after them, chase them and grab them. But every time he went to try and grab one, it disappeared. So he came up with a really clever idea. He took a piece of string and he tied it to the first chick's leg. And then he took the next bit and he tied it to the second chick's leg and so on and so on and so on until his piece of string had five chickens attached to it. And so wherever one went, the rest followed. The only trouble is that hungry hawk had a good memory. And she thought, I had quite a fine meal over at that farm yesterday. I'll go back and see what I can find today. And she flew over the farmyard and she looked down and she saw a ripe, plump, chick and she swooped down and down and down again and clutched it in her claws and up and up and up she flew but when one chicken went what happened to the rest they all, went. Went. they all went as well and the rich man came round the corner to see all of his chickens <laughs> disappearing <laughs> off to the horizon oh no oh dear what was he gonna do I'll tell you what he was going to do. He was going to become so angry, so enraged that his temper erupted. And that poor boy didn't lose his, didn't leave his room for seven days. Not a thing did he eat, and the only thing he had to drink was the condensation from the window when he licked it. Mm. Well, that rich man had decided the boy was no good as a shepherd, who decided to send him as a mer as a messenger to his friend, the judge. And so the boy collected a basket and a letter and off he went, trudging through the snow. And he peeked under the cloth and he saw that inside the basket there was a rich bunch of grapes. Oh, and he was so thirsty and he was so hungry. And they wouldn't miss one, would they? Not one grape, not out of the whole bunch. You wouldn't, would you? 
so he plucked one and he popped it in his mouth and it burst and the juice went down his throat and soothed his parched lips and his dry throat and oh but you know what it's like when you're eating grapes you can never have just one can you <laughs> so his hand slipped in and he took another mmm he thought i better leave it there better not have any more and he arrived at the judge's house he gave the basket the judge read the letter filled back the cloth and started to count <laughs> and then looked at the boy and said two are missing and the boy couldn't understand it he thought that the letter had told the judge oh i'm so sorry he said i was ever so hungry and ever so thirsty i won't do it again oh give me another chance and the judge who was a kind man took pity upon the boy and he said all right i'll give you another chance and he wrote a letter and he said, give this back to your master. So the boy ran home, gave the letter to his master. Master read it. And inside the letter, the judge was requesting another basket of grapes to be taken the next day. And so the following day, the master called, the boy came, was given a basket and a letter, and off he went, trudging back through the snow. But oh, his lips were dry and his belly was empty. And he got halfway down that road and he thought, just one, will they? No, just one. Yeah. And then he thought about the letter. And he thought, well, last time, the judge found out because he read the letter. I've got a really good idea. If I place the letter under a rock, it can't see me eating the grapes. <laughs> <laughs> and so the letter was under the rock. The boy peeled back the cloth. He plucked a grape. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was a really good grape. It was really sweet and juicy. And then he plucked another. Mm -hmm. I've had to stop there. And safe in the knowledge, the letter hadn't seen a thing. He picked up the letter, <laughs> dusted it off, put it back in the basket, and off he went. And he got to the judge's house, handed it over. The judge read the letter. And what did he do next? Two He counted the grapes. And he looked at the boy and he went, you've eaten two again, haven't you? Oh, how did you know? <laughs> I hid the letter and everything. He couldn't see me. I don't understand. And the judge, realising what the boy had thought, started to laugh. He laughed so much that tears were coming down his face. And he looked at the boy and he said, oh, I haven't laughed so much in ages. Thank you. Thank you. To repay you. I'm going to write a letter to your master. And so he did. He wrote a letter that told that miserable old miser that he should take better care of the boy, give him good food and nice things to drink, and somewhere warm to sleep. And the letter was folded up, given to the boy, and the boy went home with hope in his heart. And he gave the letter to his master, and the letter was read, and the master was furious. Who dares tell him what to do with his own slave? And so he decided to make that boy's life a misery from that point on. He turned to him and he said, I want you to go and chop the hay for the animals. Me and the wife, we're going off to the Christmas fair and this must be done by the time we get back. Do you understand? And the boy nodded. And so off went the master and his wife and the boy started to chop up the hay. You know what it's like when you start doing a lot of physical activity? You start to get quite hot, don't you? And the boy had his jacket on and as he was chopping the hay, ugh, ugh, it was too much. So he took his jacket off and he threw it, not realising where, upon another pile of hay. And as he was chopping, all, it, all the dust was going up in the air. And you know what it's like when you get dust in your eyes? They get bleary and sore, don't they? And he couldn't see properly, but he just kept chopping because he had to keep chopping in case the master came home. And he chopped and he chopped and he chopped. And he was done. He was done before the master had come home. Brilliant! He wiped his eyes properly and he looked down and he saw what he'd done. He chopped his jacket in to the hay. His jacket was ripped and torn beyond repair and now the hay, well it wouldn't be good to man nor beast for it had bits of jacket sticking out here, where and everywhere. 
Oh dear. The boy felt fear wriggle round his stomach like a snake. And he thought, I've got to find somewhere to hide. The master is going to come back and he's going to be so cross. And so he ran into the house. He ran up the stairs and he hid under the wife's bed. And whilst under the bed, he saw next to him there was a pot which had a skull on it and two crossed bones, the sign for poison. And that boy, so terrified was he that he thought it was best to take the poison and be done with it before the master came home. And so he opened the lid and gulp, gulp, gulp. He took the poison down and he waited for it to take effect. But little did he know that that wasn't poison at all. That old wife kept her secret stash of honey in that poison jar so that nobody would eat it because it was marked with poison. Nobody would take her sweet treat. So instead of feeling the first pangs of death running through his body, now he's out on a bit of a sugar high. <laughs> <laughs> but he heard the carriage coming down the lane and he thought, oh no, they're going to be back. And what was I thinking? The wife, the first place she's going to go, she's going to come to her bedroom, isn't she? I can't hide here. So he sprang up under the bed and he started searching for a new place. And he found the cupboard. So he leapt into the cupboard and there he stood. And as he looked, on the shelf next to him, there was a bottle and upon it was a skull and two crossed bones. And he thought, oh, when the master finds out what I've done with the hay, when the mistress finds out what I've done with her honey, they'll be furious. I'd best end it all now. He grabbed that bottle of poison, uncorked it, and glug, 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 glug. He drank it all down to the last drop. But what he didn't realize is that wasn't poison at all. The master kept his best bottle of wine in that cupboard with a poison sticker on it so that nobody would take his sweet treat. So instead of feeling the first pangs of death come over him, he started to feel a little bit giggly. <laughs> a little bit giddy. <laughs> but then he heard the mistress and the master come into the house and that sobered him up like that. And he thought, oh no, what am I going to do when they find out everything that I've done? I'm going to be for it. So he leapt out of the cupboard, he ran across the landing, and he jumped out of the window, and he ran. He ran as fast as his feet could take him. He ran as far as he could go, not knowing where he was heading. But finally, <gasps> when he stopped, out of breath, he found, him the he found himself beside an old chapel. And in it, a couple were getting married and the music was playing out across that frosty landscape. The snow sat heavy on all the gravestones in the graveyard and the boy wandered through looking and wondering until he found an empty grave, one that had been dug and was waiting for an occupant. And he thought, what a good place to hide. Nobody will look for me here. And so he got himself down into that grave and he hid. And in that graveyard and in that grave, that boy started to think about all of the horrible things that had happened to him. Losing his parents, being treated so badly by the mistress and the master. And he started to weep. And he started to wish that he could be with his parents again. It was Christmas time, the time of family, and he had none. And the tears flowed, and the music sang and played and lulled him to sleep. And in that sleep, he dreamt of paradise and of meeting his mother and father once again. But slowly and surely, his eyes they flickered open and they looked upwards and there on the edge of the grave stood a girl, a beautiful girl with quick hazel eyes and she looked down at the boy and she said, what are you doing in there? And he said rather glumly, it's the best place for me. Nobody wants me and nobody cares. And she said, that's not true. I know for a fact 
that you made the judge laugh when he hadn't laughed in years. You brought joy into his life. And I know for a fact that you fed the hungry hawk when she was starving, when she had nothing else. And I know for a fact that she thanks you. I know for a fact that she loves you, for I am that lady hawk. And if you come with me and return that love, I shall take you to my sky kingdom where we can be together forever. And what was said next? Well, that was between the boy and the lady hawk. But if you stood next to that chapel on that cold wintry day, and you watched as the sun went down and painted the sky orange and pink and purple, you would have seen, raising up from that graveyard, two hawks take to the wing, high in the sky, flying so closely together that with every wing stroke, they touched and brushed each other, and they flew off into the distance. And as for the master and the mistress. Well, they had been so black-hearted, so miserable, so mean. Well, that catches up with you eventually. Their house burnt down. They lost their wealth, their home, and all of their friends, because all of their friends heard that how mean they'd been to the boy. And so they spent the rest of their days in poverty and misery, just like they'd made that boy's life. Oh,